guys ready to dive into the Word together? Dive into what God's been showing us. This is part two, part three, excuse me, part three of the You Asked For It series. So week one, we started out with, you had the question, how do I deal with stress? How do I deal with stress? And we talked about letting God lead our life and that we take everything to Him. And Well, week two, last week, we talked about spiritual warfare and how we battle and putting on the armor of God. And Well, really, I'm telling you, my week has been so incredibly different since waking up every single day and putting the, the armor of God on. You can go back online and watch that message if you desire. And I'm telling you, multiple conversations I've had this week have been about that very thing and helping show people the spiritual battle that they were in. And well, a matter of fact, this morning when I got up at 530, as I was praying through the armor of God, a friend of mine had asked me, hey, can you text in that prayer and, and, and lay it out for me? I greatly appreciate it. And so at 530 this morning, as I'm praying it, I'm typing it out and I send it to him. So his phone kind of dings really early because he's an hour behind us. So that would have been about 445 his time. So I feel bad for him. But so I sent, I, I put it together and sent it. If you're interested in having that to be able to pray over your life and putting on the armor of God every day, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to put that in your hands and have that prayer available for you because I want to come alongside you guys and being able to live this life that God has called us. So that was the second question you guys had. And these were questions that you posed back at Easter. So how do I deal with stress? How do I do that? How, what, what is spiritual warfare? So we talked about spiritual warfare. The third most asked question that you guys posed at Easter was, how do I share my faith? How do I share my faith? And I love the fact that you were asking this question. And I just want, I just want you to know that. Like, this is a great and amazing question that you have. Because the truth is, there is a calling for every single one of us. Every single one of us to be able to share. As Jesus followers, if you're in this room and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are asking me that question, hey, Brandon, how do I share my faith? That means that there's a drawing inside of you, a desire inside of you. And it's very clear in Scripture that Jesus directed well, truthfully, he actually commanded us, commanded us all as his followers, not just those in full-time ministry, all right, all of us to share our faith. Are you guys familiar with the comedian, and, and I know Christian comedians don't like to be called Christian comedians, they like to be called comedians, but this guy's name is John Christ. Anybody know who John Christ is? Okay, so he's a comedian. Christian, okay, so he's a, Christian, he's a great guy, it's amazing to watch, but he's got this new little skit out, and he's talking about how, how to know and what to pray over when it comes to food, like when you're supposed to pray, like are you supposed to pray over appetizers, or you have to wait till you get to the main course, it's, it's hysterical, like it's so funny to go and watch, well he makes this one comment when he's, he's saying, well how do you know who is supposed to pray when you're eating together, you know, how do you know who is supposed to pray, and, and he goes, this one's easy, it's whoever is the most spiritual at the table, Whoever's the most spiritual at the table, that's who is supposed to pray. So if you've got a pastor or a missionary or a Christian blogger, you're off the hook, all right? So that's the way he presents that, and it's really funny. But that's what, a lot of times how we operate and look at sharing our faith. It's like, well, we'll leave that up to the pastor to do, or we'll leave that up to the missionary or, or the Christian blogger to handle and share that. But it's, it's not the truth. It's actually not what we're called to do. It's actually all of our role. Every single one of us. And so by asking that question, you even are seeing that it's part of your role to share the faith as well. To share the good news with every single one of us around us. And so Jesus said to his followers, all right, and we're going to read this together in Mark 16. He didn't say this to his pastors. He didn't say this to his, his uh, Christian bloggers, you know, of the day and time, the ones banging in the tablets. He didn't, he didn't say it to them. He was talking to his followers. He says, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. To everyone. I love that word everyone. We'll see it pop back up in just a few minutes. I love that word everyone. Paul told us this in 2 Corinthians. We, he's talking to the church of Corinth. He says, we, meaning the church, are Christ ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? It's a representative. It's a representative. So we, the church, are Christ representative. God is making his appeal through us. Not to us, through us. So that means that when we have been appealed to through someone, it doesn't stop with us. Now that we are believers, it should flow through us. God is making his appeal through us. 
So it is in us to take this charge, this commission, this calling that he's put on our life to share the gospel, to share the good news, to share our faith, to tell people about Jesus. Because like us, that we are believers, those of us in this room that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we know this verse and we hold to it. You may not be able to tell me where it's at, but it's in Romans 10, 13. And this is what we know. Everyone, here it is, that word again. I love this word because that means that God is not selective. It says everyone. And and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but have you ever been to a place that felt selective? Maybe even a church that felt like it was selective, like you had to be a certain way to get in. Or Here's the thing. God says everyone, meaning he's not selective. That's the heart of this church. That's why you see so many people serving today that says welcome across their chest where they're serving. Because on the shirt, we want you to feel welcome. That's why when you walk in the front door, there's a big banner, 19-foot banner that says welcome across there. We want you to be welcome, welcome home, welcome when you get here. Because we're not selective and neither is God. He says everyone, everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Us as believers hold on to that verse. We know because we call on him, we are saved. And therefore, that question that you're asking, how do I share my faith, riles up inside of us because we want every one of his kids to know him. Amen? So before we go any further, let's pray. God, we love you. And Lord, there's really not a better way I can think to start a prayer than saying, I love you. And so, God, we just come to you right now telling you we love you and we thank you for your, your love for us. And, God, I pray that during this message, Lord, what is being shown here is not anything from off of my tongue or from my lips, God, but it's from you. And, God, that you bless every single one of us in a way to, to move about answering this question and living it out of how do I share my faith? So, Lord, I pray that you move in all of our lives today and just to help us to be able to grow and see more of your kids come to know you, get to know you, come back home because of your heart for them. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here's the thing. Once we find Jesus and God does a work inside of us, our mission on earth changes. Once we find Jesus and God starts doing a work inside of us, our mission on earth changes. And it's not just a written mission, so it's not one that, okay, well, now I follow the word. It's right there. No, it's one that is actually instilled in our spirit, like a calling on our life, just like with Daniel. Okay, so Daniel in the Old Testament, if you don't know a lot about Daniel, definitely go read on him. Amazing, amazing man of God who loved him dearly and loved God dearly. And here's the thing. He lived in a culture. He lived in an amazing city. It really was an amazing place. Now, it was an anything goes kind of city, but it's where everything was cutting edge. And here's Daniel. He's got a little influence in his life. And, well, all of a sudden it's moved to a place where people are asking him not to acknowledge God. Not to talk about God, but he stayed true to his calling, the calling that was placed on him because of his relationship with God. He stayed true to it. And that's why I write this down. Our purpose is a lot like Daniel's. Our purpose as Christians in our generation, what we've been blessed to be a part of, is to influence it. Influence it for Christ. That is our purpose, is to influence our generation for Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ, that is what you have been called to do. So do you know what it means to influence? I want to talk about that word. That's a pretty powerful word, and I hope I can give you some great insight on it. Influence by definition means this, the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone else. So the character, <clears throat> the development, <clears throat> or the behavior of someone else. So let's talk about and break that down for a second. It says to have an effect on character. So if you're influencing somebody, you have an effect on their character. What is character? The moral qualities of a person. That is their character. In other words, their heart. Their heart. So we're affecting their heart. Well, what about development? It says that if we're influencing, then we're affecting their development. Development means a specific state of growth and advancement. In other words, their purpose. So if we are sharing Christ, we're starting to influence and affect people's purpose. Well, the other word was behavior. So if the word influence means that it affects people's behavior, what is behavior? The way in which one acts or conducts themselves, especially towards others. So 
we actually are affecting their actions. And this is what Jesus has done in our life and what he calls us to do in, in others is that he changes our heart so we influence people so he can change their heart. He uncovers our purpose so we influence people so he can help uncover the purpose that they're supposed to live out. And then we help influence people so that way he can shape their actions. Same thing he does for us. He has changed our hearts he has uncovered our purpose, and he is shaping our actions on a daily basis. Because of the influence of Christ has had on us, we desire for others to be influenced by him as well. It's just a desire that he has placed inside of us because of the fact we see his influence on our life. So it just drums up inside of us that we want to do the same thing. So if we're asking how to share our faith, that means that we have a desire to do so, right? Can we agree? Like if you're going, how do I share my faith? If you ask how you do something on anything, that is a quick example, real quick of a notice that is you have a desire to do it. You have a desire to do that thing. So we have this desire to want to share. We want to do it, but that word how also means there's a level of uncertainty that we need cleared up. So how also speaks to desire, but it also speaks to uncertainty. Like, can you show me? Can you tell me? That's my goal today through the word is to be able to do that very thing. So what keeps us, though, if we're wondering how can we, we need to be able to address what's keeping us from it. What's keeping us from being able to speak or talk or show or live out this life or share our faith? We want to get the good news out. We want to get the gospel out, but something is there. So there's really only one reason. There's only one reason we don't. And so write this down. We do not share our faith because of fear. Fear. Fear is what stops us. It's fear that, 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 that cripples us. That's what fear does is it cripples us. And it keeps us from sharing our faith. So why? It's fear. Let's talk about some fears that we may have. How about fear of lack of knowledge, right? Like fear of lack of knowledge. Like, Have you ever found yourself like, well, I don't know that I can talk to that person about my faith because, I mean, like, what if they have a question I can't answer? I mean, I think I know that verse, but for all I know, it actually could be three verses put together. I, don't, I, I just don't know. And well, what if they ask me where it's at? And I'm like, well, it's in the book of limitations. You know, all right. And so, and, and so we're, we're all confused and we just don't know, you know, and we're just we're, it's lack of knowledge. Well, what if they have a point of view and I can't counter it? I mean, OK, so maybe I got this lack. What if they're so smart they change my mind? I better just not say anything. I just, so lack of knowledge seems to be a fear that we have that can keep us from sharing. What about fear of opinion? How about that one? Well, well, what are, well I mean, if, if, I start, if, I, if I start telling them about Jesus, I mean, I mean what are they going to think of me? Are they, are they going to think I'm crazy? And like the next thing, oh, Brandon, what are you going to do next? Go out on the corner of the street with a bullhorn and the sign saying, you're going to hell. I mean, like, what are they going to really think of me? Are they going to group me in with those Westboro like crazies? I mean, what, what, is, what, what does this mean for me if, if I do this? So what do they think? I mean, I really like that person, and I really like their boat. So I don't know that I want to say a word because it's fun out on the lake. So even people's opinion, we worry about people's opinion of saying something or sharing our faith or talking about God. So it restricts us. We wonder, will they reject me? Another fear that we have is uncertainty. Uncertainty. You're like, well, would it, will it even work? I mean, it worked for me. But, I mean, is this kind of like one of those 1990s one-hit wonders? You know, like it worked for me, but it ain't going to work on any other, anybody else. Like this song is done. Like we kind of get caught up in this uncertainty. Well, I just don't know if it'll work. And, and so that grips us. And then we move to this place where, well, I have this fear of pressure. And, well, what if I fail in this pressure? And, well, I just don't know that I can. And one of the gravest mistakes that we possibly could make in seeing someone's life change is thinking that it is dependent on us. See, that's what we start to realize is, is we go, well, well if, if, I, if I don't say it right or if I don't, if I don't do it the right way or, or what if I miscommunicate it or, or what if I do jumble those words up from the book of limitations? I just don't know, right? So can, there is not a book of limitation, limitations, right, okay? Just so you know, all right? God has no limits. But we have a shirt around here that says, change lives, change lives. Our keyboard player, he was actually, he's actually wearing it today and you can see it. 
But it's one of those things that we take a look at and we're like, man, this pressure, I just, I just don't know. What if I fail? We have to realize it's not dependent on us. We are called to share the good news, not change someone's life. We're called to share the good news, not change someone's life. So, because here's the thing, that's only what God can do. Only God can do that. So I'll explain to you in a minute what that shirt means, that change lives, change lives. I'll explain that a little bit more in just a few moments. But is this your fear? Because I want to set you free from it, that you are a part of the story. You are not the star of the story. You are part of the story. So the pressure is not on you. Paul tells us this about fear. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Of power, love, and self-discipline. So if there is at any moment, in really any circumstance, and especially here, that we feel fear rising up inside of us, it's not from God. It's Satan trying to suppress us, to keep us from talking, to make us think that we don't know what we're talking about. Or what if somebody changes our mind? Or what if it's not going to work? Here's what fear does. I want to repeat this multiple times because God just laid this in my heart. I wanna, here's what fear does. Fear will force you to ignore. It will force you to ignore. What you ignore, you forget. What you forget is no longer important. And what isn't important is lost. That happens anywhere in our life. Because this is what fear does. Fear will force you to ignore something. And when you ignore that thing, you move to a place where you forget about it. And what you forget about is no longer important. It doesn't carry any importance anymore. And once it's no longer important, it's absolutely lost. It's lost. What we have to recognize about our God the one that has saved us, we need to understand God is distracted by the lost. What so many of us and what we find ourselves in this place where we get to the place where we forget and it's no longer important, it becomes lost. God is distracted by the lost. He wants to see his kids come back home more than any of us possibly could imagine. He wants to see his kids come home. His word tells us that he will leave the 99 to go after the one. He will leave the 99. And what it's saying by saying he will leave the 99 to go after the one, that does not mean that he's going to hang out with the 99 and yell for the one, oh, come back. Oh, man, come on, come back, come back. It doesn't mean that he's going to hang out with the 99 and party and be like, man, I still got 99, so be it with the one. Maybe they'll come back around. It's not like when you got $100 bills, $101 bills, and all of a sudden you lose one, one of them. You're like, well, no big deal, I got 99. See, that's how we think in the natural so, I mean, I hate I lost that one, but I still got 99. I mean, come on. That's not our God. He is distracted by the one that is lost, by the one that is lost. So many Christians, so many of us are caught up in church wondering about ourselves when our God is distracted by the lost. We're thinking about us. We're asking the question, well, what about me? Well, I, I mean, I'd like to get fed. I mean, come on, I want to be fed. When I go, I want to be fed. How many times have you heard that? Are you guilty like me in making that statement? I mean, and here I am, I'm, I'm focused on me. And God's not even looking at me. He's all caught up in the lost. But I make statements, well, I didn't really like that. No, I didn't like it. Or, well, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to do that. Or, well, I'd enjoy it if they would blank. Uh, you know, me, me, we get caught up in that. People, Jesus said he would leave the 99. Do you know who the 99 is? That's us. That's us. I mean, we get caught up in thinking we could come to a church, and then that's where we're going to meet God? That that's where we're going to get this amazing experience? And he's going, hey, you guys can take care of yourselves. I get it. And I got a whole different message on how the 99 pastor each other and care for one another. But we're looking at Jesus, and we're wanting to have a heart of God, and it is one that is distracted by the lost. Distracted by the lost. What we need to understand is the only thing he is thinking in us about is how he can help us in our situation. If we need to be blessed, if our marriage needs to get better, our finances need to get better, if our job needs to get better, our situation needs to get better, he's paying attention. 
Because he knows it's a distraction from the enemy to keep us from seeing the lost and going and helping him do what it is that he's out distracted by. So he will bless us and he will do those things, but it is for the benefit and the purpose so we can start to, instead of going, hey, well, look at me. Man, I am so blessed. He's going, I blessed you so you can bless somebody else. That is how he is looking at blessing us. Any prayer that he answers and, 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 and need that he meets is to free us up to join him in his efforts to get his kids back. That's, what, that's why he's answering our prayers. That's why he's doing what he's doing. The distraction he has shows the love for the one. It is the same kind of urgent love and attitude that he has towards you and me that caused him to come after us when we were the one. It's the same place that he's at. Our motive for sharing our faith must always be grounded in this kind of urgent, loving attitude that our father has. Think of it this way. It's like a parent with three kids. I got three boys. So it's like a parent with three kids, and they lose one of them in the store, right? They lose one of them in the store, and I mean, he's like, uh, I mean, yeah, I got two more. I mean, look, I mean, one's gone, but I mean, I still got two. I mean, God, I, I mean, maybe I wasn't supposed to have that one. No, come on. No. That thought never crosses our mind. Well, I have two more. Never crosses our mind. If I lost Dax in a store, if I lost Dax, and he's fast, so it's probably pretty easy to do, okay? And so if I lost my youngest in a store, do you think that I am worried about what Carson and Davis want? Like if Carson's like, Dad, come on. I mean, like, look, I know Dax is going, but look, I've got this Lego set. Man, it is 7,500% off. Normally, it's $1,000. You get money back when you get... You think I care? I'm going to karate chop that Lego set out of his hand. Like, are you for real? Are, you, are Davis going, Dad, look, check out these shoes, bro. Like, I mean, it's the last pair, and I'm in line with, like, two other people that want them. We got to make a decision. Do you think I care about those shoes? Or we get in church, and we're like, oh, the music's too loud. Oh, I'm going to step on some toes. Oh, it's just too cold in there for me. Oh, it's just too hot. I sweat a lot, so it's always hot in here to me. All right. But we get in that mindset. And God's going, do you not know what I'm distracted by? Are you kidding me? I got some lost kids. And you're one, you're, all you want to know is if we can turn the music down a little bit. He's looking at our motives. He's looking at our heart because the same thing with my boys. I'm not sweating what they want in that moment. If anything, the thought that crosses my mind for Carson and Davis is help me. Help me. Please help me find your sibling, your brother. Help me. That's the only thing I'm thinking about for them. That's it. That's it. It's the only thing that I'm concerned with when I'm looking at them is going, please, please. Tommy, it's like if I come to you even in that situation. If I came to you and I said, man, my son, I don't know. Would you be going, well, hey, man, look, you know, I, I, I got to go get my oil changed. Um, you know, I'll be back in a few minutes and then I can help you. The words out of your mouth would be, what can I do? What can I do? That's what God is looking for us to step up and do. Not to say, well, I need this, or I want this, or can you do this? He's, he's looking for us to come up and say, God, what can I do? I am found. Thank you, Jesus. Eternity is mine. I, what can I do? What can I do? And then even based on some spiritual levels of it and the relationship that you have with him, you don't even have to ask. You don't even have to ask. Because you already know, like, oh, there's lost kids. I'm going. I'm going to find you know what? I got this department. I got this area. Oh, there's lost kids in our, in, our, in our kids' area today? Oh, I'm serving there. I got that one. That one's mine. Oh, man, there's some homeless out there that doesn't know? All right, you know what? Outreach? Boom, I'm on it. That's mine. Oh, you mean there could be somebody that shows up at our church on Sunday? You know what? Parking lot. That's mine because I want to make sure when they pull in the parking lot, they feel welcome. I got that. I got that. I got that, I got that department. That's mine. 
He is looking for us to come to him and go, what can I do? What can I do? Because the only thing he's looking back at us is going, help me. Please, please find your brother. Please help me find your sister. And so often as a sibling, we think about, and even with kids, we see this, and sometimes our attitude reflects it, but we should never think, ever, well, it's not my responsibility. It's not my responsibility. I'm not the parent. I mean, come on, God. I mean, you can't keep up with your own kids. Tommy, would you, would that be the words that came out of your mouth? If I came up to you and said, man, I can't find Dax. I don't think that's what you would go, well, bro, you can't keep up with your own kids? I mean, seriously? Like, that's not my problem, dude. Go find your own kid. But it's like we do that. And we may not say those words, but when we're not part of it, or we're not looking at it, or we're not distracted by it too, we have this thought that's basically the same thing. I'm not the parent. It's not my responsibility. I didn't lose them. I didn't lose them. It is yours. It's mine. It's our responsibility because we're family. We are family. You guys ask the question. I'm doing my best to answer it biblically. You want to know how do I share my faith? I want to build up in you why, and then we're going to talk about how. God wants his kids back. He created every one of us. We're all created by the hand of God and our daddy. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever referenced him that way, that term of endearment. But you get in a moment where it's just you and him, you go, Daddy, I love you. Hey, what can I do for you today? See, our daddy, our father, wants all of his kids back. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, praise God. You are his and he's now saying, is there anything I need to get out of your way I can help you with to go and get more kids? Because he does not have the desire, it tells us in his word, to see anyone perish. So how do we share our faith? To see this happen, how do we do it? You can see the why, you can see the buildup of it, what it looks like in our relationship with God. But Brandon, how do we still do it? I want to do my best to answer that question. So to share your faith, you just have to be real in Christ. You've got to be real in Christ. This isn't on your screen yet, but I want to speak about what it looks like to be real in Christ. I know, here's the thing, I know it's not easy to share. I get it. And that sometimes you don't know what to say. And, and, and the thing is, it's okay. It's perfectly fine because it's really not as hard as you think or what we may have been believed to make us think. So how do I share my faith? Sharing your faith starts with this. Live it out daily. Live it out daily. It really isn't something that has to be said because others will see it in, your, in, in our life. He'll, they'll see it in our life. So it's like, all right, well, if you're helping me see how, that's a question that beckons evaluation. Like, i got to evaluate myself now. Is my life one that is a representation of Christ if he is my Lord and Savior? Is it the way that I live, the way that I do things, the way that I communicate, the way that I talk, the way that I carry myself? Is it one that would be a representation of Jesus Christ that people would look at my life and say, hey, I want to know more about that. I want to understand more about how do you have so much joy in so many times of trial? How's joy in your life so much? That they start to ask, because here's the thing, people will see it in our life, they will realize who we really are, and all of a sudden, as we believe it and we're bought into it, they will see it. So how are you talking? How are you communicating? How are you living? It has nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with the fact of other people being able to see our Father. How we live our life does matter. It matters. Many times the truth is the door opens up for the other person, not because we said something, but because of how they saw we lived or how we handled a situation or how we communicated in a conversation. That's what usually opens up the door. We just need to be us living for Christ. In the nine o'clock service, there was a lady in here and she told me a story this week when I was sharing a little bit with her and she was telling me about a friend of hers. And this friend of hers does not have a relationship with God. And she's good with saying, hey, will you pray for me? But she actually spent a week with her, and she was with her in her home. And, and as she was with her in her home, she was just being herself. So she would get up in the morning, she'd get her devotional, and she would read it. She would read her devotional. And then from there, she would, she would, her, the friend would say, hey, what are you reading? 
She goes, oh, this is my morning devotional. And she would leave it there. She'd go, well, what's it say? I can read it to you if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, read it to me. So she would read it to her. And then on the very last day, this person told me, she said she was busy, got carried away, and, and she actually did not do her devotional that morning. And she went downstairs to finish up work because she was flying out. And she said the lady sat down across the table from her, and they were already diving into work together. And she sat down across the table from her, and she goes, hey, are, are you, are you, you're not going to read today? She goes, you know what? Thank you, because I had actually forgotten. She didn't go, oh, you want me to? None of that. She goes, you know what? Thank you. Yeah, you know, I need that too. I'm going to take a minute and do that. And she says, well, you read it to me. Doors open up because of how we live our life. How people see us live our life. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've prayed over a meal and people walked up and said, thank you for praying. Now, I know they're probably believers as well, but if I've got believers seeing me do it, I've got people that are not believers also seeing it as well and going, hmm, hmm, okay. It opens up doors for the conversation to begin. And students, I need to talk to you for a second. If you're a student in this room, there is a whole lot coming at you to try and get you to live a life that is not representing Christ. It's going to be hard. It is. It really is. Because you got a lot of people that tell you that that's not fun and that's not the way to live. But I want you to know this. Your identity is in Christ. It is not in what people have to say. Your approval is in Christ. It is not what people have to say. So as you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you feel that draw because it's already put in you, don't be afraid to live it out and live as an example for the Lord because people around you will take notice and God will protect you, students. He will take care of you. You just need to be you living for Christ. Be you. Do you, boo. All right? So be you. Living for Christ. Jesus tells us this in Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. You, I love it. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. I mean, that's just silly. I mean, it's like if I told Junior to fire this light up over here and then bring me a bucket. Well, why do you want a bucket? I don't know. I just want nobody to see my light, I guess. Well, then why'd you cut the light on? I don't know. I just felt like cutting the light on. I don't know. No, it's silly, right? No, you take it just like it says there. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. It gives light. It doesn't shine on somebody. It gives light for people to be able to see. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out of all for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. It lets us know right there by giving our life to God and living out our life with these good deeds that are representation of who he is, people will glorify God. They will praise him, our life as an example. And the thing is, people usually could care less to hear what we say anyway, right? They was like, I don't care what you're saying. I want to see your actions. And I remember growing up in, in the sales world, um, Zig Ziglar, a, a, a statement that I heard mentioned from him. I, I'm, I don't know if it's his or not, but I'm just going to go ahead and credit to him. He used to say this, and I would hear it. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They look at how you live. St. Francis of Sissy said this, preach often, and if you must, use words. What? Meaning your your actions are preaching. Preach often and if you must, use words. Because there's absolute truth to that old adage that, that there is more caught than taught. There is more caught than taught. We want to start seeing people's lives change. Then we move to that place where we live it out daily. The next one that I want to be able to show you guys is this. Share your Jesus story. Tell your Jesus story. You've got a story, and when I was writing this, I wrote it out as to share your story or tell your story. But really, really, when I was in it, he goes, Brandon, so is it your story that's going to save somebody or help lead them to me? It's me in your story. Don't leave me out. Emphasize me. Put the emphasis on me. Not a statement of well, how I'm living now. No, our statement should be, Jesus showed me. 
we share our Jesus story. Peter tells us, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. You know what that means? That means to put him first above everything, including yourself. So that way, even when you're communicating or somebody's acknowledging something, you say, it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. You're pointing everything to him. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope. What is the reason for your hope? It is Jesus. We should always be prepared to have that story to share Jesus that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So our story that we have is the one that is attached to Jesus. That's the one that people will hear. It's the one we're encouraged to give the reason for the hope. This is the life we are to live out, and we do it with gentleness and respect. We had our own story. We had one without Jesus. Those of you that are believers in here, you know what I'm talking about. You had your own story. And the direction and the things it was going, it, was, it, it, ended as a, it was a bad story. Like, that was a bad ending. It's kind of like the most recent Avengers movie. Like, man, that's a bad ending, right? That's like, that's what you're going to leave me with? But at least they can make another Avengers movie. Our story before Jesus had a bad ending. Now it doesn't have one. Because Jesus is the redemption in our story. That's our true story. And what's interesting is this is the original story. It's not the one that he's making up along the way and trying to figure out. This is the one that God intended from the beginning of time when he created you and laid you out and planned you. This is a story that was intended for your life. The one God had designed for you. And guess what? Your, your Jesus story is significant. It's significant. And it was intended by God for this day and time, at this point in history. He chose this point in history for you to be alive and have the Jesus story that you have. Because here's the thing, someone needs to hear it. You need to be able to share it with someone. Someone out there is waiting and needing to hear your story. Maybe you're going, well, I don't know my Jesus story. Then I pray that he helps you start to shape it and be able to put him into it so that way you're able to communicate it. We often think that sharing our faith is about the other person. So it stops us. So we talk to them when we do. We talk to them when in actuality it is the exact, it's the pronoun in the very question you ask. How do I share my faith? My, my. I'm not trying to impede it on you. So you talk about the, the life change that you have experienced. That's why that shirt says change lives, change lives. Because when you're talking about the fact that Jesus has changed you, all of a sudden lives will start to realize that Jesus does something amazing and you start to see what it is he's capable of, how he lives out his life and through you. And all of a sudden people see it and their life can be changed by him and theirs. You don't try to tell them what their Jesus story should be. Don't try to tell them, well, you, if you do this, this will happen. Well, you should do this. We share our story, and we let God reveal their story in them to them. It's not our place to tell somebody else their story. We tell our Jesus story. So we live it out daily. We tell our Jesus story, and the third and final thing is, is let God lead you. Let God lead you. Don't let you lead you. So often we go into these situations, well, well I'm going to say it like this. Well, I'm going to think about it this way. Well, this is how I'm going to get them. Well, I'm going I'm to be crafty in my words. This is how I'm going to nail it. We think that, that we are going to lead. We have to let God lead us in what we are doing constantly and what we are saying continually. Because it says this, Jesus tells us that only God can draw people to him, right? So we can be eloquent as we want. But the word tells us in John 6, for no one can come to me. This is Jesus talking. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. So we can say all we want to in the natural. We can be as crafty and creative as we want. We can take it upon ourselves to do it. But unless it is led by the Spirit, they won't hear it. They won't receive it. And nothing will happen. And truthfully, unfortunately, we may even push them away. God draws people to Him. He uses people to do it. Remember back at the very beginning, the verse says, through us, through us. And since he's using us, his people, to spread the word, 
but we le- we've got to let him lead. He's the boss. Like, all right, boss, that's how you want me to go about it. That's what I'll do. I want you to lead. How do you want me to do this? What can I do? What can I do? God, today, what can I do? People being saved isn't our ability, is it, isn't in our ability to see it happen. It's in our willingness to be used. So as we go about and we want to know how to share our faith, we show it, we share our Jesus story, and we let, we let God take the lead. And how do we even live out these principles? How do we live out these principles? All right, Brandon, I hear the why. I hear it. There's missing kids. I'm on board. All right, Brandon, I hear it. I need to check my life, see how I'm living, because I need to make sure I'm being the best example I can. All right, Brandon, I, I, I hear you. I've got a story that Jesus is in, and I need to make sure that he's emphasized. All right, Brandon, I hear you. I'm going to let God lead. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. But how, how is it that I live out those principles? How do I make sure I do that every single day? It's about being a willing vessel. Write this down as we close out. God isn't looking to use the capable. He's looking to use the willing. Satan wants to distract us by being caught up in, are we capable or not? That's our thinking. That's what Satan puts in there for us to think. God gets caught up in, are we willing? That's his desire. Do I have a willing person? Do I have a a Tommy that I'm missing my son? And he steps up and says, hey, what can I do? What can I do? I got a Josh that'll step up and say, hey, what can I do? What can I, I got a John. Hey, what can I do? What can I do? Robert, what can I do? Brenda, what can I do? I know, I know Dax is missing. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for us to come up and say, well, God, this is all I've really got. And Well, I'm not that smart. I don't know that many words in the Bible. Um, I know the word Jesus is in there in love. And well, Jesus loves. There we go. Um, that's about all I got. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have that many resources. Um, I don't really have a place. And he's trying to say, I'm not looking at any of that. Are you willing? Are you willing? Yes, God, I'm willing. He isn't looking for whether we're capable or not. He's looking to see if we are willing to help him go and share 